I've got some free time right now. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. What are you interested in? Just straight sex or? Well, it depends on what you want, honey. Okay, uh, my rates are 65 for a half hour. Okay, I'll see you in a few. Okay, bye. Chicago, Milwaukee, New Bedford, Richmond, a lot of Richmond, Daytona Beach, uh, Orlando. It's all over the country. We're all dealing with the same problem. And we're lucky to have one person assigned to human trafficking investigations because a lot of counties don't have that. A lot of agencies don't have that. You know, they're just working cases as they come in, whereas I could be a little bit more proactive because this is what I do all day, every day. And those are the type of cases I work. Right now we're on the outskirts of Harrison Township and Vandalia and Butler Township. And those are, you know, communities where you wouldn't always suspect that that kind of stuff's going on. When I first heard of sex trafficking, I thought what I think most people think and that's about the little girls in Thailand or someone in a foreign country or that very occasional person who is kidnapped and taken outside the country. The first time that I found out that sex trafficking was happening here in the United States and it was happening in this area, I think I was almost in just a little bit of disbelief. I didn't want to really think that it was happening because I think most people don't understand what it really is. I really first got energized about this. We found an 18 year old girl sitting on a corner who was raped, beat, and she's sitting on the corner crying for her mom, an 18 year old kid. I said enough is enough. That's when I started our trafficking detective. I went after Detective Denji because I knew she's very passionate about people, very passionate about the community. She's very driven and she's doing a good job, you know, trying to protect our young women in this community. During these internet prostitution stings, we're gonna be uh, doing this operation for several days, and we need to get some items for our location to stock it and to have snacks, fill cabinets, that kind of thing. We're going to need some condoms, some uh, lubrication, because those are things that a real escort inter internet prostitute would need, and uh, we need to have those things there as props. Morning. A lot of preparation goes into um, the sting, um, trying to set it up. And what our hope is, is that we can catch not only Johns, we also want to stop prostitution, but we want to catch anyone that would be pimping out those girls. We want to get to the root of the problem, if at all possible. I have to do a lot of research online. I have to use a lot of technology because that's where it's happening. So if I put in USA and I put in Ohio and a lot of these pictures, it's very obvious that the woman in the photograph's not taking the picture herself. Someone's taking the picture for her. You know, when their backside is to you, they're not taking that photograph. So somebody's helping them do that. So are they willing? Are they being forced? Are they being coerced? I started off on the internet. I worked for a pimp. I didn't know that. I didn't know that those still existed. I thought it was like this even bargain thing, but I worked for a pimp. I describe it as 
doing things that you don't want to do, even though yourself you justify that you're doing what you want to do, in the end, somebody has control over you. I did things that I would never, ever thought I would do. You know, I did. I wasn't raised that way or anything, but when sometimes you feel like your back's against the wall, you have no choice. I grew up in a pretty upper middle class family, probably more upper than middle. I grew up with a mom and a dad. I definitely was the typical high school cheerleader. Um, I cheered my entire life. I was ended up homecoming queen, student council secretary, like that was my high school journey to the public eye. I um, started, you know, dating this guy. He was a police officer in our community. At the time, I was 15 when this started and he was 21. He kind of presented the idea to me of, you're gonna have sex with these people and they'll give me money and we'll split it. This is a business opportunity. <laughs> I ended up like trying drugs with a friend um, and I realized like how much I liked it. And he was like, well, I'm a cop, I know where to get more, like I can get you what you want. And so I started using drugs and eventually it was like, I needed the drugs enough that I was kind of like, yeah, you're okay, I'll do it. I didn't realize how big it was gonna be. I think my daughter's story is probably atypical. She was not raised in a home where drug use was acceptable. She was not raised in a home where parents partied. She was not raised in a home without adult supervision. She grew up in church. I still to this day can't understand how she went from my daughter that went to church to working in a brothel and being a heroin addict. I still don't understand how that happened. This is the way I remember her. That was at King's Island. She was just a little thing. And that was the first time she rode a roller coaster. It was like the little Scooby-Doo. That's one of my favorite pictures of her. Oftentimes, law enforcement can create our own ad and um, see what happens, see what kind of interest we get. And a lot of times they'll ask me for a full body picture or a picture of my boobs, or which I don't. I just, I only go so far with this job. <laughs> Sometimes they'll tell you right then what they are looking for, what they want you to do to them, what's your rate for an hour, what's your rate for BBBJ, which is a bare, bareback blow job um, without a condom. You know, this weekend I was at a volleyball game. Uh, luckily I was sitting at the top of the bleachers and uh, John sent me a nude photograph of himself. Um, you know, I was sitting with my husband and my best friend and that pops up on my phone and luckily, the other moms around me and parents around me didn't see that, but it would have been kind of embarrassing. And, and, you know, I don't want rumors being spread about me. You know, I've been happily married for 20 years, so um, it's just awkward moments, and um, it's part of my job. I had a lot of interest all night long and um, all morning. I've had a few more dates booked. Now we're approaching the crossroad of 75, State Route 75, and 70. And so you can pretty much get wherever you want in the United States by these two uh, interstate highways. This is a college town and college students are also getting involved in the trade. They are hosting ads and there's a site that young 
And usually female adults will use called Sugar Babies, and it's for like younger college girls. And there's definitely no shortage of pretty young girls in college towns. So I ended up graduating high school, um, top of my class, and I got an offer to cheer at a college. And I was like, this is my way out. Like, this is it. I'm gonna move to college. Everything's gonna be perfect. This is gonna end. I'll just start over. It's gonna be a new life. So I went to college and I was sadly mistaken that the trafficking just continued with me. Now it was new clients and new territory and it actually was probably a riskier situation because I, we didn't know these people. And a lot of my clients, like my biggest client was a church pastor of a mega church. They were other law enforcement officers, firefighters, lawyers, doctors, pastors. I mean, there is no, no profession that doesn't do this. I hate to say it, but we're known for having the cheapest heroin in the whole state. And when you have people that are addicted to drugs, they wind up doing things to maintain their drug use. They become very, very easy prey for sex traffickers. All right, guys, I'm just gonna go through this PowerPoint, but I sent it to most of you. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it because I sent it late last night. Sergeant Ables is gonna be the supervisor. Decoys make sure you give the arrest takedown signal loud enough so everybody can hear. If you see weapons or contraband, advise over the, the wire. Oh, it's, hey, let me grab some lube just in case. I'm gonna put the lubricant in the other room. So that'll be my sign. I'll try to get up and leave the room. Decoys remember to let the suspect bring up either money or the sex act first. I've got the code sections on here for solicitation, promoting, criminal tools, and then compelling. Anybody got any questions? Uh, I'm a little nervous. I'm just going through in my head, like what I'm gonna say, and um, making sure that I know what I'm gonna do when I call in a second. I think we're ready to go. I have a lot of confidence in my team. I don't want to let them down. And then you'll go all the way to the back and there's a good place to park back there. Um, and then I'll step out so you can see me and I'll, you know, get your attention. What are you in? What are you driving? All right, I'm going Sheriff's office. Stand up, brother. Stand up, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your hands behind your back. Yes, sir. I'm with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office Range Task Force. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, obviously, there's some issues here. You wouldn't be sitting there in handcuffs if there weren't some issues. Right. All right. What brings you here today, Tom? I do this about twice a year, and my life gets kind of crazy sometimes because I'm so busy that I need an outlet. Are you married right now? Yes, sir. Obviously, your wife doesn't know you're here. No. No, sir. Let's say you leave $150 on the counter for him. You, you realize that some of these women are being maybe trafficked and that money's not going to that woman, that it's going to somebody else. She might get $20 out of that 150. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody else is getting that, right. the rest of that money. Absolutely. From here, you'll go downtown. You'll be booked into the county jail. Thank you, sir. So we have a female coming and um, she's has an ad and she is prostituting herself. Some of our male decors that have made contact with her and set up a date, so she should be coming and we'll see how that goes.
sheriff's office. You, you can leave that. You can leave that on. You can leave that on. Throw that back on. Throw. Okay, throw that on. Please, no, please. Get dressed, please. Excuse me. Detective Benji and then uh, Sheriff Seppi. Okay. Do you want to explain to me what what was going on today? Okay. You have an ad online right now. Someone else does it for me. Who is that person that has it online for you? Um, my friend. A friend? I don't even know if I know their real name. Does he get a cuss? Um, yeah. How much? I don't know exactly how much. I don't do it every day. Well, how much was well, he going to get for this day? $50. So they sent an Uber to come get you mm -hmm. and bring you here. Yes. And they were going to send an Uber. You were going to contact them. Yeah. Has he ever threatened you or told you you better not rip him off? Or? Um, I don't know. I don't know if he ever threatened me. Or if he just told me to get out of the car. Mm -hmm. Or if he just told me to get out of the car. Are you scared of him? I mean, are you scared to cross him? What would happen if you didn't give him his $50? I don't know what would happen. He would never do that. You know, we took her into custody and she, I think she's probably being trafficked, but she didn't want to admit that to me. She had um, admitted to that she'd been, you know, abused as a child. Everything that she said was in line with the trafficking victim, but she didn't admit that. Actually, I've got some free time right now. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. What are you interested in? A half hour, just straight sex, or? Um, well, it depends on what you want, honey. Okay, I'll see you in a few. All right, Sheriff's Office, take your hand out of your pocket, brother. Hello, where's the Sheriff's Office? Turn around, put your hands behind your back, man. Put your hands behind your back. Sure. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, anything you need to know about me, man? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, you got a second pair of seats? Yep. Yeah. Just so you know right now, you're being detained, okay? Just for our safety, we'll, yeah. we'll let you know a little bit more what's going on here. So, it's Texas with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, obviously, we're doing a... Um, uh, quote unquote prostitution sting today. Um, the, uh, okay. You know, can I, uh, can I just mention one thing? I, I think I'm going to throw up. You think you're going to throw up? Stand, Stand by. Yeah, I'm yeah. Really sorry. That's all right. <clears throat> Feel better? Okay. We're here with the. Uh, the sheriff's office and uh, prostitution sting. Um, you know, in light of the situation, the biggest reason we're out here is for uh, human trafficking. Any questions for us from, you know, about what happened to me? Well, I suppose I'll find out, right? What, I mean, yeah. Well, you'll be given a bond, and then once you, you'll have the ability to post bond, uh -huh. um, you know, you have a chance to make your phone call. You mean I'm going to jail today? Uh, that will be up to the other uh, detective, but there's a good chance. Oh man, you know this this, this is gonna blow my life up already, and I I just don't need that really. I mean I don't have anything to tell you. I'm just a fucking goof that lives south of here, going to work, acting stupid. A, a, a lapse in judgment can blow your life up, and I've worked very hard for a long number of years to not have a. a you know, to have a, just an, an average life. I did feel a little sorry for him, um, but then I thought about his wife and how she would feel about him doing that. And then I wasn't as sorry for him. And also the fact that he's um, just making our problem harder to combat because he's throwing money at it um, and 
uh, encouraging these women to sell themselves or men who are pimping them to sell them, that, that makes me feel less sorry for him. As you can see, the men that are frequenting prostitutes in this area cross every social economic boundary. We've got all ages, we've got all races, we've got men that have probably little means, we have men that have great means. And so, I mean, one of the gentlemen today showed up in a Mercedes. So hopefully by publicizing what happened in the last few days, by putting these, I hate to say it, but putting their faces out there in the media, that that's what they got caught doing. I think that it does send a clear message that this is not okay, it is illegal, and they shouldn't be doing it. You probably don't feel like you should be here. Or maybe you feel that you don't deserve to be here, that maybe that you're wrongly treated, or that this is just some kind of victimless crime. I hope after this class is done, you'll start to feel differently about how this kind of activity affects our society. I went to the John School two years ago for attempting to solicit. It actually changed my life forever. And also the John Education Program is to educate individuals charged with soliciting for prostitution about the consequences of their actions. It's not really meant to necessarily solve all their problems and help them with their problems, but to make them aware of the consequences of their actions, to show them that this is not a victimless crime and that this really does have an impact on, on themselves that they don't realize and on, on others as well. I didn't even know about human trafficking before John's school. I just thought it was basically people who were doing it to make money. To me, I didn't think it was them being forced into it. Um, but after going through John's school and learning that, it basically broke my heart and I wanted to do whatever I could to help make my mistake into something positive. Immediately after, I got involved with them and have been a part of that ever since. Looking back now, it makes no sense to me, but at the time it seemed like maybe this could be the thing. Um, and I was arrested. As long as there's a demand, there's always going to be a supply. And um, my point in trying to teach them is, is that, that law enforcement's going after the demand more try to have an impact on the supply. CATCH stands for Changing Actions to Change Habits. Back in 2007 and 8, we started uh, taking a look at the revolving door crime of prostitution. You know, as ladies get out, come right back. Matter of fact, 80% of women arrested for prostitution or other sex crimes in America come back, they recidivate, and it comes through my courtroom. So I decided to try to figure it out. Help you get to where you need to be. The overlap between human trafficking and prostitution is almost universal. Uh, we have statistics that say 92% of women who are in prostitution are also human trafficking victims. Before I came into Catch Court, you know, I blame myself for it. Like, um, I got myself into that situation and yeah, it took me a while to believe that I was a victim. I got picked up by Vice and I tried to run and I think, you know, just sitting in that jail cell knowing that um, I was pregnant. I don't know who her father is and <laughs> Um, you know, what to tell her when she's older. I just kept thinking about, there's no way I can stay in my addiction and stay out there and have a child. Catch Court is a two-year intensive probation model and only people who sign up voluntarily. We don't force anyone into this restorative court. Once we get them in Catch Court, they have residential treatment, which means we control where they live and who they see and who they talk to, whether they have access to social media. Almost everything about their life is controlled until they can learn how to have healthy and safe relationships. They come to court every week. 
Uh, normally a judge doesn't see you if you're on probation unless you're messing up. Now I see them every week and I check in with them and I see their progress through the notes and I get to interact with them. I think they like that. I think they like the fact that a judge takes an interest in their life and their well-being. We have what we call a trauma-competent courtroom now. Instead of looking at someone and, and I say, what's wrong with you, which is the way I was trained, I look at someone and I say, I wonder what happened to you. I've been through so much in the last three years that I would have expected my whole entire addiction. Tora, Jody, Hannah, the whole catch court kept me together. <coughs> Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have made it this far. Over a year ago, I had my third son. And by then, I'd been in addiction and prostitution for about five years. I wanted out, but there's not a lot of help, I guess. They like give you a list of people to call, and it's like, but I don't need somewhere right now. All young women, and maybe all women, are at risk to be taken advantage of by some slick older man who they fall in love with and then they fall on hard times and then he requires the woman to help the family out by doing certain things for money. But with heroin, uh, you start to take the average girl at any high school in America and she gets hooked on an opioid and then it's very quickly from, you know, from friendship and some drugs to, hey, you owe me and you need to pay this back. Anytime you use that fear, intimidation, or even a, a drug addiction to get a woman to do something is, the, is enough coercion to put you as a human trafficker. It's really nice to know today that um, I am surrounded by people who want me to do better and people who support me. Um, you know, I think a lot of people look down on addicts and think, you know, like when I first got pregnant, some of my family was like, oh, you know, the poor baby. And it really hurt my feelings. Um, you know, just because I'm an addict doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm a bad mom. I know I've always wanted to help others, and I always have. I just did it kind of in the wrong way because I would let myself go to help somebody else. And you can't really help others if you don't help yourself. So when I got to the point where I could, I enrolled at Clark State. Um, I'm in my second semester. I'm going for social services technology to get my chemical dependency counseling um, certificate to go in the field of drug and alcohol. And I'm super excited, super excited. Women Helping Women has been uh, one of the most consistent ways for a, a woman to succeed in, in history. As someone put it, it's like being on the Titanic. There, you know, if you were on the Titanic together, you understand what you went through. And these ladies have all been through the same thing. They can talk to each other the, in the way that they understand. It's really neat to watch. I've always said that I'll never get married and I'll never have children. And both of those things have happened. And I think a lot of people question like, well, how are you ever intimate again? Like, how do you trust a man again? And it wasn't easy. There's still times that he'll like walk up behind me and just put his arm on my shoulder and I have a complete meltdown. I feel like a lot of people feel like this is something that you have to deal with on your own and you can't. You know, there's a community of survivors that will walk alongside you. I think I just want her to grow up and know that there is some evil in the world, but then again, you know, that people who, you know, walk through the darkness can see the light again. Mm -hmm.